Well, good morning and welcome back to our series on Faith Forward, a brief two-part encouraging, uplifting series to just, to just draw us closer into the presence of God and to give us a clear picture of our next steps. I'm so excited to continue this, uh, this series today. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to enter into your presence. Thank you for this opportunity to receive from your word that has been that that has been protected and that has been anointed for all of these years, thousands of years, God, written from so many different places, from so many different people across the, the span of history, Lord. I just, I thank you for the opportunity to receive from your word that has been anointed by Jesus, by through the Holy Spirit for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that we might be equipped for every good work. I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that moves mightily when your people seek your face. And Lord, here we are seeking your face, seeking your truth, wanting to know what you have next for us in this journey, in this race, in this life of faith. So I pray that you would be faithful, God, to the promises of your word, to speak to us clearly that we might receive from you and that we might be forever changed. We love you, Jesus. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, uh, I want to start with our verse here from Hebrews chapter 12. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We are running a race. Make no mistake, you're not just sitting going through life. You're not just sitting on a, on a, a cruise ship just enjoying things as they go by and enjoying the, the things of this life. There are certainly many things things to enjoy that God has created for us, but we are running a race. This is a, a, a battleship, not a cruise ship. This is a race that we are on, striving, running forward to receive the prize, doing everything that we can, pushing through the cramps and the strains and the, and the breathing challenges, and our heart is racing, and we're giving it all we've got. That's what this life is. We are running a race of faith, and so let us run with perseverance. Perseverance, perseverance, because we have to endure. We have to push through the race that is marked out for us. God has a race marked out for you, marked out for me, and he wants us to run it with fervor and with courage and with perseverance. So how do we do this? I love this verse. We do this, he tells us, by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author of and the perfecter of our faith, the one who initiates it, the one who perfects it. So Jesus has, has given us each a measure of faith, the Bible says in Romans 12. He's given us everything we need to say yes to him. That's our play. That is our one card that we have to play. It's not to be perfect. It's not to do everything right. It's to say yes to him. When he says, I want, I want more of this from you. I want you to, to lean into this. I want you to let go of your anger. I want, I want you to let go of your pride. I want you to embrace all that I have. We don't have to fabricate any of that. He does the work. Through the life, the work of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and then the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor. He reveals to us all things. We just say yes to him. He initiates it, and one day he is going to perfect it. At the end of our race, when we are made complete by the blood of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, we're given our new bodies, they're restored to everlast. Our faith will be made complete, and it will be made sight. Come on. This is what Jesus says. We do this, we run the race with perseverance by keeping our eyes on Jesus. So last week we looked at the faith forward focus. We looked at number one of three things and today we're gonna look at the other two. I didn't even tell you that this is what we were doing, but this is what we're doing. We're looking above us first. Who is above us? What is above us? The faith forward focus has to start on beholding the goodness of God. You cannot be freed from the challenges of your own self, your own situation, uh, relationships, finances, all the challenges that we face. You cannot move forward and have freedom from those things unless you are focusing 
first on who God is. You can't become loving in a, in a difficult situation. You can't be full of peace in a difficult situation. You can't bring that to the table for the people around you. You can't lead well. You can't do any of these things well unless your eyes are first fixed and focused on the goodness and the glory and the mercy and the love and the faithfulness and the power and the majesty of our great God. We first focus on what or who is above us. And that's what we looked at last week, the story that God has laid out through the context of scripture, 66 books, a love letter written for his people. We look at everything that the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit have chosen to do, three distinct beings, but which are not separate in really any sense of the word, but who are united perfectly in, 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 in purpose and in plan and action in ways beyond what we could ever imagine, united to build a family and to show us their nature of perfect love. We behold that. We behold the stories of scripture, how God was there for his people over and over and over, how he's made good on every promise, how his promises are yes and amen, how he can be trusted. Then we look in our own lives and we say, we, we, we say, God, you were there when I saw your hand at this point. I know that you brought me through this. When it seemed like it was impossible, you spoke, you gave the encouragement, you carried me on, you provided for that bill, you provided for that need, for that dream. Lord, you are a good and a faithful father. We first look at what is above us. Do you want to grow your faith? Do you want to take territory for the kingdom? Are you tired of just sitting on the sidelines or shooting buckets for the enemy? Do you want to stand as a spiritual warrior in faith? Do you want your faith to move forward to greater levels than you could have ever possibly imagined? This is the first thing that you must do. Behold the goodness of God. Focus first on what, on who is above you. Now for today, we're gonna look at the next two things that you can do to move your faith forward. Next, you focus on what is inside of you. What is inside of you? Now this isn't a, just like a feel good message. This isn't like a self-help class. This is rooted in the word of God. Now if you're first focusing on what is inside of you, see these three points out of context will have no power for you in your life. You can't fir first focus on what is inside of you or else you're gonna find that you're, you're inadequate, that you're empty, that you don't have anything to offer. That's what you'll find without Christ. You'll find depravity, you'll find sin sickness. You'll find that you're, you're longing for something greater because God did make you even, if you, even if you're living in denial of him, even for someone who has rejected him or doesn't believe he exists or doesn't want any part of any of that, there's something inside of them that is stirring for something greater and for a deeper connection and for a deeper purpose because God has ordained mankind to be in his image, to, to, to be able to, to take territory and subdue the earth and, 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 and to lead and to prosper and to multiply and, and has made us to be connected with him. But if we look inside of ourselves before looking at who he is, we will find brokenness and emptiness. So the order matters and looking at what is inside you comes after beholding the goodness of God, after reminding yourself of who he is and who he has proven himself to be. Now we look inside of us and what do we see? We see from John chapter 17, Jesus says that God has placed his glory on the inside of us. He's placed his very glory on the inside of us. And I've used the illustration before. I heard it from a mentor of mine that you're like the armored truck that has the the valuable treasure on the inside of it. And when the, when the robbers come, they're blowing the doors off of that truck, they're, they're penetrating it, you know, with, the, with the, uh, the, the heat gun, whatever you call it, I forget what it's called. They're, they're trying to get on the inside of that truck, they're trying to take the truck out, not because they have anything against the truck, but because they want what's on the inside of it. And so too, the enemy is after you because the glory of God that he created for himself. Remember, he said, I will ascend to the mountain of God. I will be like the most high. It says in the book of Ezekiel that Satan said to himself, God has now taken that thing that he so desperately craved 
and he's placed it on the inside of you. You are made in his image. You are made to be his ambassador. You have been created. You have been restored. You have been called. You have been redeemed. You have been called by name, chosen, adopted into the family of God. The Bible says that you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. The Bible says that, that you, you have been given the mind of Christ that the same power that raised you, that raised Jesus from the grave lives with inside of you, that nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hand, that you're a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away. All things have become new, that you've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer you who live, but Christ that lives within you in the life that you now live in the flesh. You live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and who gave himself for you, that you have purpose, that you have glory on the inside of you. The faith forward focus has an identity, your identity is rooted in what Jesus says about you. And some of us struggle, some of us wrestle because, with our identity because in different ways we've been maybe rejected in our lives or maybe we're striving, we're, we're working for, to, to obtain you know, recognition or to obtain affirmation or to be seen or to be celebrated or to be valued or to feel like we're a part of something. And so there's nothing wrong with, with doing our best. There's nothing wrong with trying to be the best. There's nothing wrong with, with pursuing excellence, but the the and God will use any of it. He'll use a talking donkey. He'll use a pagan king, a pagan pharaoh. It don't matter. He'll use anything. So that's not in question. The question is, what is our experience going to be on this faith journey? If we're believing what the enemy says about us and has said things about us through people that we may, that we may not love so much or maybe that we do know and that we do love, if we're believing what he says over what God says, then our experience, we're going to be robbed of joy. We're going going to be robbed of peace and no one can snatch us out of his hand, but we are walking in, in, on this path that's just totally unnecessary and beating ourselves up and believing all of these lies and God can't use us the way that he wants us to because we're just churning in this, in this little whirlpool of lies and, and of false identity. And I just want to, I just want to share this with you today. Maybe it was someone in your life that spoke negative things over you that said that you, were, you weren't enough or that you weren't welcome or that you weren't a part or that you didn't fit in or that you couldn't make it or whatever kind of negative thing it could be. And, and we can pretty quickly identify some of those things and some of those people and, 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 and begin to root them out, get to the root of, of the trauma by the power of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we don't realize that people that we love might have had something to play, a part to play in that trauma as well and in that false identity. Maybe it's people we love or, or respect even where maybe in one moment they just weren't operating in the full gifting of the Holy Spirit and they said something that they didn't really even mean but it's just stuck with us. I've had this happen before where I go to someone to address something and they don't even remember saying that and they apologized for saying that and, and they didn't even know but it was something that I was holding on to that stuck with me. And so just like Peter comes to Jesus, literally one, this is mind blowing. One second, Jesus is like, who do you say that I am? And Peter's like, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, Peter, you are the rock. Like uh, upon the rock, I shall build my church. And that is the rock of this, this knowledge, this revelation that Peter just embodied himself by saying that, by saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Yes, and upon this truth, I'm going to build my church. And that's why he changes Peter's name to rock because he became a representation of the truth that Jesus Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And Jesus builds his church on that. And so this is a beautiful moment. Peter's identity is redefined. And two seconds later, literally like five seconds later, Jesus says, okay, now it's time for me to go and do the work that my father has set out for me. I'm going to be given over. I'm going to be handed over for death. I'm going to be crucified and I'll be raised again on the third day. And Peter's like, no, Lord, this will never happen over my dead body. If they want to get to you, they'll have to go through me. And literally stepping in, even though he was one of Jesus' best friends, one of the three, the three closest to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, in the room when the, the little girl was raised from the dead, Jesus brought these men, these three men around him to, when, when he needed faith in the room. 
Peter's one of these three. And yet in this moment, right after his name has been changed, and he stood in faith and courage, he's now standing against the will of God for Jesus' life because Jesus knew that he was to go to the cross. But Peter wasn't looking at God first. First he was looking at this situation and so he said, no, no, it won't happen. And he aligned himself with the plan of the enemy which was to keep Jesus from going to the cross. And so Jesus called it out and said, get behind me, Satan. It could be even people close to us, even people that we love in just a moment of, of, of responding in the flesh rather than the spirit. Something is shifted and we believe what they say and our identity, what we think about ourselves, who we see ourselves to be, it begins to be altered by that. And some people will say, no, you're not all these things. You're just, I'm just a lowly, like I'm just a lowly sinner. This is another, another face of pride, kind of two major faces. One is like, I'm the best thing since sliced bread and, and because of me. And then the other is like, oh, I'm just so low. I'm just nothing. I'm just, I'm just a dust on, on you know, this planet. I'm just a worm. I'm just whatever. And both are arrogant in two different ways. I'm, I'm here to tell you today that you are who God says you are. You are who Jesus says you are. And so I've spoken to one and I will speak to the other that says, I'm just so lowly, I'm just nothing, I'm just, I'm just struggling, wrestling with sin, and I'm just doing my best job. And there's this verse from Romans 7 that so many people quote in this conversation. Uh, Romans 7, verses 15 and 16, I think it is, where Paul is, is having this like moment of transparency, and he's saying, man, sometimes I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I do want to do, and oh, like what a wretched sinner I am. Who will free me from this body of death? Like he's just in this moment, and so people resonate with that, and they're like, yeah, yeah, like oh, I'm just so wretched. I'm just so lowly, but I've got, I've, you've got to keep reading, okay? <laughs> I don't know how to say this. You can't just take a verse. These these books, they're written not just as one verse, but of a full chapter. Not just as a full chapter, but as an entire letter. You have to understand when you're reading scripture, you, you cannot take little things out and pluck them out. I know sometimes we can only read a few verses for the sake of time or we're focusing really deep on something, but it's all in context. Context means with the text. They were written as letters, comprehensive letters. I wouldn't take one thing that if my wife writes me a letter and I just take like one sentence out of it and not understand it in the full context of what she's saying, we're gonna have major communication problems. And people have communication problems with the Bible because they don't read it in context. Romans 15 and 16 do it does say that, uh, Romans 7, 15 and 16 does say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm, I'm, I do the things I don't want to do, I don't do the things, that, like, what is wrong with me? And then it says in verse 17, but even when I sin, it's, no lo- it's not me who sins, but it's the sin living within me. Paul immediately separates his identity from those decisions that he had made. And he says, I don't associate with these decisions. I don't claim them. They don't define me. That's not who I am. A righteous man falls seven times, but gets back up again. They're not defined by the number of times that they were down. They're defined by the fact that they're either up or they're on their way back up. They're always moving forward, always standing back up, always learning from the mistakes because then they're not failures, they're points of growth. If you make a mistake, if you fail and and you learn from it, that is not a failure, that is a lesson. A failure is when we make the same mistakes over and over and over and never learn from them. Paul immediately separates his identity from the sinful behavior that he just, uh, the, the sinful action that he just committed. He says, Even when I sin, it's not me who's sinning. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm wearing the perfect robe of righteousness that Jesus has placed on me. I may have sinned, but it's not me who sinned. It's the sin that's living within me. Now his his carnal nature is no longer a part of who he is. He's just, he's just still, we're still living in a cursed, a broken world. There's still sinful desires. They're still part of the flesh, but that is not who we are. It is no longer I who sin, but the sin that's living in me. 
And we have to begin to separate these lies from the enemy from the truths of God's word. And if you are not, I'm just gonna lean into this right now. If you are not absorbing the truths of God's word on a daily basis, if you are not hiding his word in your heart, then you are going to sin against him. And I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about faith forward, being further along than I was yesterday in sanctification, being made whole. We've been made righteous with God, justified. That's justification to be made right with God by the blood of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. It takes nothing else. We are made right with him. We have the robe of righteousness. Now, sanctification means to be made holy. And this is a process that happens over time by saying yes to Jesus, by learning the lessons from, from the mistakes that we make, by separating our identity from sinful things. No, no. I am the righteousness of God. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I am seated in heavenly places. I have been chosen. I have been adopted. I have been redeemed. And we separate the lies of the enemy. Too often we allow them to get all twisted up and it's because we don't root ourselves in the word. The Barna group recently did a study. Shocking results. Only one in 20 believers open their Bible outside of a church service. Let me repeat that. One in 20 people who claim to be Christians and who go to church open their Bible outside of a church service. I encounter moments for coaching, moments for pastoring, moments for counseling all the time on a daily basis And many, many times, my response is, when was the last time you were in the word of God? When was the last time you knelt down in 15 minutes of prayer? What verses have you been memorizing lately? What has the Lord been teaching you through his word lately? Because a lot of times our problems, we act like they're all complicated and we need like a psychologist to come in and fix them and we need medication and we need all these things and Sometimes we just need to be in the word. Imagine if you went one week to the next, one week to the next, one week to the next, only eating once a week. What would your body look like? You'd be emaciated. You would, you would not have the nutrients that you need. It, it, you can't live like that. It's the same with the word of God. You can't just go receiving from a pastor week to week and that's the only time you've cracked the scriptures do you know what, what has been sacrificed for us to have the word of God in our hands today? How many martyrs have been killed, burned at the stake, fed to lions in a coliseum? How many places in the world people still don't have access to a Bible? They will give anything. I've seen videos of Bibles being given in, in, in different areas, different regions of the world where they're outlawed and people will rip a page and hide it and cling to it like it is the last piece of bread on earth. We've got to fill ourselves with the word of God. You have to know what God says about you so that you recognize the counterfeit and then you have to cast it out. You don't accept that. You don't dwell on that. You don't embrace that. Who cares what someone said about you when the God of heaven has declared who you are? And then the third piece of faith forward. So we've looked at what is above us. We've looked at what is inside us. And now, finally, we look at what is before us. What is above you? What is inside you? What is before you? Now, this is relating to your situation. And I'm going to tell you right now, most people's problem is that they look at their situation first. Most people's problem is that they look at their situation first instead of their God first. Faith forward means looking at Jesus first, looking at your identity second in him, and looking at your situation last. Of course we have things to deal with. Of course there are challenges. Of course there are opportunities in this life. There are things that are difficult. We go through We go through the unknown, we go through pain, we go through grief, we go through confusion, we go through heartache, we go through desiring things, dreams, needs for the future, like we go through so much in this life. 
And if our eyes are looking down at our situation, and that's all we ever see is our own two feet, then our world is very small, very small. Because that's all we ever see is our own little situation. And so every small thing that happens is really, really big. If I'm looking down and I'm just having to, to step up onto a curb, that's like, a, that's like everything. It's like a big step. Why is this curb in my way? I don't understand. Or imagine you're climbing a ladder, but you, you're not looking up. You can't see the top. You're just taking a step, climbing the rungs of that ladder. Oh my gosh, when is this ever going to end? This is impossible. This is just going to go on forever. We don't see the big picture. Now, if I look up, all of a sudden I see something totally different. I see the plans. I see, I see that there's an end point. I see all these things. Now, if I zoom out and I get on an airplane and I fly up to 30,000 feet, I can't even see those infinitesimal little problems anymore. They're, they're dwarfed by the, the scope of reality, a much bigger reality than I ever imagined. When we look at God first, who he is, who he's proven himself to be for thousands of years and for eternity. Everything that he's done, to, he's, in, he's in charge, he's in control, he's sovereign. We can trust him. We don't have to worry so much. And then we look at who he's called us to be in our own identity, our own uh, seated with Christ in heavenly places, joint heir with Jesus Christ, mind of Christ, the power that raised Jesus from the grave, living on the inside of us. Now I look at my situation, and I'm like, okay, first of all, I got a big God, and this is like a small problem. Second of all, I have everything I need to be the one to handle this issue. I can bring the peace of Christ to this situation. I can bring the joy of the Lord to this situation. I can bring leadership. I can bring confidence. I have something to offer because I have the word of God in my mouth, the sword of the spirit that is the word of God, able to divide between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, comes out of my mouth because on my lips are the words of Jesus as I have hidden his word in my heart. And I am filled with the zeal and the fire and the courage and the confidence of the Holy Spirit, the same confidence that took the martyrs to be burned burned at the stake, or to be boiled alive, or to be beheaded, or to be thrown to the lions. The same spirit lives within me and gives me everything I need. I can step into this situation. I'm not afraid. I don't have, I'm not worried about it. I'm not anxious about it. Those things happen when we're looking at the situation first and then, yeah, it seems a little daunting. It seems like it's a lot. It seems like it's too much to handle. But when it's the last thing that we look at, because first we've beheld the goodness of God and we've stood in the identity that he has given us, now all of a sudden we're at 30,000 feet and maybe this situation actually this don't even deserve the time of day it's going to work this is a small fire that's going to go out as quickly as it flared up and i'm not even going to worry about it and then other situations we're able to step into and bring the fruit of the spirit and and be a life-giving force that jesus himself is working through our hands working through our feet working through our words to do what he would do in that situation. Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what would you have me do in this situation? Lord, what, what would you have me do in generosity? What would you have me do in, in kindness? What would you have me do in peace? What would you have me do in joy? What do you see about this situation that I haven't even seen? I wanna be used by you, Jesus, to bring change to draw people into your presence and to give them a clearer picture of who you are. Because this situation, that don't matter. It's like, it's small. It'll be here, it'll be gone. I'll be here and I'll be gone like a vapor in the wind. But what I do for you, what I do for your name, how I magnify your glory and lift your name in all the earth and point people towards your goodness, that will last forever. Don't look at your situation first. Look at your God first. Now, Paul says in the book of Philippians, he says, I don't mean to say, so he, this is Paul, right? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little context. This is a guy that wrote about half of the New Testament. 
This is the guy that was used by God probably more than any other human being in history to achieve. I mean, he built the first ever mega churches in these major cities. I mean, they will have the, in the ruins of, of some of these cities, like you, you'll find archaeology, different stuff that there were huge like plants of churches and they just, they all over the world, multiple beside each other, just unbelievable what God accomplished through Paul and to clarify some of the deep and powerful spiritual truths, just absolutely amazing. He goes through the list, right? He's been shipwrecked and he's been bitten by snakes and he's been raised from death and he's been up to the third heaven and he's been like every, every experience. Paul's walked it. He's walked the life of faith. And here's what he says. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. Even Paul, not done yet. There's no, he, he's not arrived but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ, Jesus, first possessed me. And he goes on to say, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. So Paul says, out of, out of all the things to focus on, and there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot, uh, there's so much. <laughs> out of all the things that there is to focus on in life, in relationships, in family, in church planting, in spreading the gospel around the earth, in your career, in your job, in your finances, in your relationships. And out of all the things there are to focus on, Paul says, I focus on this one thing. Now he says one thing, it's gotta be pretty important, right? He says, I focus on this one thing. Now ironically, he says two things now instead of one, but they're kind of one in the same. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. This wisdom that I want you to take from Paul. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. One of the greatest enemies of faith is allowing the future to be crippled by your experience of the past. This is a race moving forward. Now, if you stopped at the first mile of the marathon or the 20th mile of the marathon, or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You either finish the race or you don't. And faith is about pushing forward, always moving forward, always looking, God, what do you have for me next? What is my next yes? Just like, you know, King Saul or Judas, like there were a lot of yeses along the way, but eventually there was a point where they just said no to God, no to the Holy Spirit, no to the stirring of the Spirit. And just said, no, I'll not go any further. And their race ended before the finish line. The key is to forget the, whatever happened to you in the past doesn't matter. Oh, I didn't have the same upbringing as someone else. Oh, I didn't have a dad like they did. We didn't have the same financial situation that they did. I didn't, I didn't go, I wasn't a, able to be filled with the word as a child like this person was. I can't do as much. Always the past, the past, the past, inhibiting the future. No, 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 no. Paul says, I focus on this. You want to talk about a past? Paul had a past. Paul was raised in the religious world. He achieved much in the religious world, sadly, for the opposing team, opposite direction. So you could say he achieved so much, but that, that wasn't, that, it's not a good thing when he's murdering Christians, hunting down their families, throwing them to the lions, holding the cloaks of people who are stoning the first ever martyr, Stephen, as they were all looking to Paul for, at that point, Saul, for his approval to kill this man of God. Paul had a past, and he says, here's what I focus on, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Some of you are like, I just don't know if I can forget my past. Maybe you can talk with Saul. Have you gone and murdered Christians, gruesome deaths by the thousands, thrown them to lions in the Colosseum? Have you stood against God and everything that he says is right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. 
You could be the worst of the worst, the chief of sinners. You could have you could have butchered every situation just horribly. You could have biffed it. You could have messed up in ways that you don't think people would even accept you if they knew about it. Listen, Jesus knows every hair on your head. He knows where you've been. He knows where you're going. And he calls you just like Gideon. He comes in while Gideon's hiding on the threshing floor from the Midianites, a coward. He calls him Gideon, mighty warrior. Why? Because he wanted Gideon to forget what was past and to focus on what was ahead. I want you to lead the armies of Israel against the Midianites. And so he called Gideon and Gideon stood in faith and it was a journey, it was a process and it always is. But at the end of the day, Gideon finished his race and led Israel into decades of peace. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. The faith forward focus, number one, always number one, what or who is above you first. Above you first, upward first. You you have a situation, don't look at this situation. Don't look at yourself. Look at Jesus, look at who he is, look at who he's proven himself to be and recognize that he is with you even now. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Then next, look inside of yourself at the identity that he has placed on you, the calling that he has placed on you, the promises he has given you. Fill yourself with his word and believe what he says about you, not what the enemy says about you through his many voices and his lies. And then finally, Now you look at your situation, you look at what is before you, and I guarantee you, if you put this simple process, a three-step process in in each one, it's only one word that is different. You can remember this, above, inside, before. You can remember this. If you put this into practice, when a situation comes in your life, I guarantee you, your faith will move forward day upon day upon day. You will walk in a closer connection with Jesus. You will be filled with more of his spirit with more of his word and you will conquer territory for the kingdom of God. The Bible says faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Walking in faith like this, it it gives you confidence. It gives you assurance when you look at Jesus first, Jesus first. This is what faith is, and one day our faith is going to be made complete. Our faith is going to be made sight, and I long, long for that day. I know you do as well. Like Noah building the ark before rain ever fell upon the earth. Like Abraham leaving his home for a place he did not know. Like David standing before Goliath saying, who is this Philistine, and why is he allowed to speak like this against the God of heaven? Like Daniel resolving himself when he was taken captive from Israel, taken into the land of Babylon, that he would obey the Lord without fail in a foreign land. Like the disciples who thought so little of their own lives as to suffer gruesome deaths for the sake of the gospel. And like Jesus who said, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. May we each take our next steps into the perfect will of God as we move our faith forward to perfection, the perfect Affection that is found only in Jesus Christ. May God bless you today and always.